Hello, art historians. Today we are going to uh, deal with um, some Etruscan art. These are our last three pieces um, of uh, Near East. Um, and we separate these from Rome because while Etruscans were in what is modern day Tuscany, Umbria, Lazio, which are parts of Italy, they were not part of the Roman Empire. They were considered too far away from Rome. Um, and so they're not considered part of the uh, Roman Empire. They were, however, swallowed up by the Roman Empire, um, you know, shortly after like around the time that this was created. Uh, actually, probably a little after, closer to like, uh, you know, probably closer to 300 BC. So probably a couple hundred years after this was created. So um, so the Etruscans were, you know, a, a, a people who uh, were located in that area of Italy. Um, actually, a, a fairly large um, civilization. Um, uh, this was found... Um, uh, near the city of uh, Cerveteri. Um, and um, what's interesting is the Etruscans had a completely different language from the Romans. Um, they had a completely different um, uh, sort of a religious belief from the Romans and a whole cultural difference from the Romans. So even though um, it, you know, the Etruscans were near Rome, they were very different from Rome. So this is a sarcophagus, and a sarcophagus is a resting place for bones, ashes, bodies, um, depending on the uh, civilization that uses it. So the Etruscans did not bury whole bodies. They buried um, ashes. Uh, so uh, this would have been the, um, the, a holder of ashes. Now, what's interesting about this sarcophagus is, and we see sarcophagus, the holding of ashes for a set of spouses, a husband and a wife. Um, and you can see that it's six feet long, it's four feet high, it's huge. Um, and you can also see uh, evidence that it was broken uh, and, uh, and it was put back together, which is um, not unusual when we're dealing with um, ancient relics. Uh, especially things as flimsy as terracotta. So it was broken and, and you can see these fracture lines. This is not a fracture line. And how do we know that it's not a fracture line? Um, it's way too straight um, and the edges of it show evidence that it was fired. So um, like baked. And so what we're seeing with this is um, uh, there's a bottom piece uh, that lifts off the top piece uh, and you can see sort of the, the line there. Uh, and then what's really cool is it's cut down the middle uh, so that the, the sarcophagus could be broken down into four parts and fired separately in four different furnaces uh, because it was just too big to fire in its current position. Um, it's just too large. It's uh, too tall. It's too long. Um, and and the, the Etruscans were not at the level of being able to uh, fire um, terracotta works in uh, that are this piece, this this large. Um, so uh, we, like I said, this was found in the city of Cerveteri, C-E-R-V-E-T-E-R-I, um, which is, you know, outside of Rome. And it was found in a necropolis, which we've talked about. A necropolis was a, a, a burial place for the dead, a city of the dead. But what's interesting about this particular work is that the city in which it was found, Cerveteri, was a ginormous city. It was gigantic. Uh, we're talking about 40,000 people. And at this time period, um, 40,000 people is a, a just a huge, huge city. Um, and so this is a very large container built in four parts. But when we look at it, we realize that while it was um, created to hold the cremated remains of a human or actually two humans, um, it feels very different uh, from that. Um, so why it feels so different is because it is unusual in antiquity to see a collection of art or a work of art 
uh, in which there's this level of realism in the construction of human bodies. The Etruscans were sort of ahead of the game uh, for realistic depictions of the human body uh, in this area of the world. And it's also interesting because um, when we look at it, uh, we see that um, the man is sitting or resting behind the woman, uh, but they seem to be roughly the same size. What we do not see here um, uh, in this piece is hierarchy of scale. In most pieces at this time period, the man is significantly larger than the woman. Um, and that doesn't happen here. And the reason that that doesn't happen here is because um, the Etruscans um, in the Etruscan Empire, uh, men and women were considered equal. Uh, women were uh, in the society, they were the equals of men. Um, and so uh, why we don't see that sort of difference in, in size is because uh, we there was not an attempt to make hierarchy of scale here. We weren't trying to make the man look bigger and more important. Um, we do know uh, that this is uh, definitely more lifelike and more naturalistic than a lot of artwork that was taking place around the world at the time. Um, it's an, an intimate pose. It doesn't mean like that it was it's sexy, but it's intimate. He has his arm behind her. His other arm is in front of her, uh, you know, resting against her arm. Her hands, she would have had something, uh, probably a way to, to do an offering in her hands as, would, as he would have, uh, because like... Um, uh, the votives, uh, this would have been a sarcophagus, but it also could have offered, uh, given offerings to the gods. Um, and then while it is somewhat lifelike or more lifelike, it's also a, a little bit what we call stylized. It's not quite exactly lifelike. Um, their poses are unnatural in the fact that um, the shoulders are too big, the feet are too small, um, the your legs don't actually move like that. Um, but uh, the arms breaking out into the space in front of them uh, is very unusual for sculpture at this time. We're used to very um, totally kept together uh, pieces um, and with these hands as free as they are, um, it's very different. Um, I wanna also, I wanna to, to scooch ahead to the next picture so that I can give you a little bit more detail. Um, we also see beautiful detail in the, the braiding of the hair at the time. Uh, we see the musculature in his arm. This is carved in the round. So we see the braiding of her hair and we see the, the, the fabric that they're laying on. And it's like a blanket that's been pulled over both of them. Look at the folds of the fabric of her skirt. Um, and then his feet are uh, outside of the, the the sort of the plane of the sculpture and her cute little slippers are on. Um, and so while it is a funerary marker, it's also a, a beautiful uh, way to commemorate these people who clearly um, loved each other. Then we start looking at um, the pose. And uh, the reason that the pose is like this is the Etruscans, uh, when they were eating, did not sit in chairs, they reclined uh, to eat. And so what you see is sort of almost a, um, a show of them uh, being relaxed uh, the way that they would at a party or a banquet. Um, it, they are on what most uh, archeologists refer to as a, a banquet so far, or a banquet couch. Um, and so we see that, that while they are dead, we have brought them into the, you know, the sort of party atmosphere of having a banquet. Um, and this is because in, with the Etruscans, um, there was not so much the, the concept of, of death being the end of anything. It was very much just a gateway or a window into the next thing. Um, and, and we see that uh, evident in much of their other art, which we will talk about um, in a little bit. Um, the key here is to focus on their upper bodies and to focus on their faces to what makes them human. Um, and while his arm is around her somewhat protectively, um, it is not around her in a lot of uh, the way that we see that in a lot of other sculptures um, at the time in other civilizations where the arm seems to um, be around her possessively. Uh, here it seems to be around her um, 
protectively and lovingly, but not possessively. And, and that's indicative of the equality of men and women in Etruscan sculpture or in the Etruscan civilization. So the theme here is a funerary marker. So we can, you know, compare this to some like the um, anthropomorphic stele um, and some of the other things that we've uh, seen that mark uh, places of death. Okay. We're going to move next to the Temple of Minerva and sculpture of Apollo. You have three images. This is one of your images. This is one of your images. And then your third image is this. Okay, so we'll go back and we'll start with this. This is the first time you've seen this. This is a floor plan and this is an elevation. So this is a bird's eye view above looking down. And what you see here are the walls that separate the three rooms that are inside and the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight columns that go across the front. One row in the front front and then a second row behind it, directly behind it, midway between the doorway and the front. And then we see these stairs. This becomes important because the, the floor plan um, of an Etruscan temple is very different than the floor plan of a Roman temple. Um, and so this is Etruscan again, it's the temple of Minerva. Uh, Minerva was the Roman goddess of wisdom and the arts um, and Apollo. And we're gonna talk about Apollo in a hot minute. Um, so when we're looking at this, we remember um, that, we wanna remember that these little rooms here where they believed that the gods went um those little rooms are called cellas c-e-l-l-a okay so it's called a cella and we we know that the etruscans did things differently because unlike most greek and roman temples the etruscans actually uh carved their cellas into three unequal uh spaces and they opened their cellas. Um, they believed that that three gods would come. They, they left it open for three gods. Now, this is the Temple of Minerva. Um, and we know that based on some of the markings inside. Who the other two gods were that were expected inside is not exactly um, clear. But three entrances for three gods. Um, and you know that, that interior stella, you'll see that one doorway is larger than the other. So the center doorway would have been open for Minerva. Uh, again, uh, goddess of wisdom and the arts, um, both Roman and Etruscans. The, the Etruscans actually believed in similar uh, gods uh, to um, similar to what the um, the Romans believed, but a, a little bit, a little actually bit different. Um, so when we're dealing with the statue of Apollo, uh, what's interesting is um, he is in Greek and Roman mythology. Um, and uh, we see that he is the god of archery and music and dance and dance and healing and the sun. He's sort of the god of everything. Um, but the temple is dedicated to Minerva. And that shows that in this town, Vei, that's how you say that, Vei, in this town of Vei, um, they clearly uh, worshipped Minerva as like their primary god, kind of like in Athens, they worshipped Athena. So we do actually, for the first time, really have the name of our artist, um, the person who constructed the um, the the piece of um, sculpture that is Apollo, um, and the entire sculptural, what we call the sculptural complex or the sculptural. Um, uh, the whole sculptural form uh, is actually called Volca. Um, and so what we know about Etruscans doesn't come as much from their ruins as it comes from um, a Roman architect named Vitruvius, um, B-I-T-R-U-V-I-U-S, Vitruvius. And he was a Roman architect um, who lived not too terribly long after the Etruscans were then folded into the Roman Empire. And because uh, he was able to do that, um, there was still like a lot of verbal evidence of, of the Etruscans. And so that's why we know so much about this. So let's talk about the first things we notice that make this temple different from Greeks and Romans. One, the three cellas. Two, the fact that it is made of wood and mud, 
mud brick and tuffa, which is the volcanic rock that appears around a great deal of Italy uh, near where there have been volcanoes, Mount Etna, um, uh, Mount Vesuvius, those sort of things. So what's interesting about these pieces is that inside the temples of Etruscans, um, they were actually painted to look like the interior of a home. Unlike, you know, the cello we would have seen in the white ziggurat or the cello we would have seen for the votive figures, this cello was meant to be um, very welcoming and very homey, honestly. Um, the interiors uh, were uh, built for um, welcoming the gods into what felt like um, a comfortable home environment. And when we look at it, you know, the average archaeologist, art historian could say, oh, that's clearly Etruscan. And because we haven't learned what we call the Greek orders yet, we haven't really learned what makes it completely different, but I'll tell you some of the things. Um, in Etruscans, uh, the Etruscan Empire, the steps are only right up to the center. As you can see here, the steps are just here. In Greece and Rome, um, the steps to temples usually go all the way across the front. Okay, so that's the first thing. This is much more square than rectangular. Um, and so that, again, sets it out as being different. It's not made of marble. Greece and Rome is all about marble. Now, the weirdest thing about this, um, and it's not one of your images, is that in the Etruscan Empire, the sculptures were on the roof. Um, this is a reconstruction of what this would have looked like. There would have been all of these, you know, um, statues that were on the roof. And what I love about this reconstruction is you can see the four columns in the front and the four columns in the back. You can see this front roof separated from the back roof and you can see all of the little people up there. And so sculptures on the roof as well as inside the temple, totally Etruscan. How deep this porch is, how there is enough room on this porch for there to be two sets of columns that are equally spaced um, between the front edge and the back wall, that wide front porch is also clearly Etruscan. The fact that the openings, the entrances are, um, I'm sorry, that are different from each other and are like decorated like this instead of just being an opening, Etruscan. Um, and uh, that it appears to be raised up. There's an underlying straightening level um, that um, then the, the temple is built on. Um, and that is made clear to you uh, sort of here. They built this sort of raised, uh, they built this like whole under area and then they built on um, it up here. Uh, and so, and again, I said the, the three cellas instead of just one, um, that's very Etruscan. So it's interesting that we see this very different type of construction. Um, this weird uh, tube-like construction is very different because it's wood. Uh, you can't really accomplish that in ancient Greece and Rome um, to, at this level um, out of just, uh, out of marble. It's, it would be much more difficult and it would be too heavy. Um, and so that is the other thing to, to have it, can't, it's called cantilevering when it hangs out over the edge. Um, so all of this shows us that it's very clearly Etruscan and it's a ceremonial space. So it's a temple okay? and you would pay homage to the gods there and things like that. So then we go to this, whoo, this statue of Apollo at the temple of Minerva. And here we see, this is when we get our, our, um, our, our artist, uh, the master sculptor Volca. Um, and so this is one of four very large sculptures that were on top. Uh, he's five foot 11. Um, and there were other sculptures on top, but there were four very large ones and then a bunch of smaller ones that were, um, you know, uh, in off to the sides. And that's uh, indicated here in this um, layer right here. So what you see here is Apollo. Um, and what's interesting is that he is also highly, um, highly stylized. His face is not realistic. Um, his body proportions are also not incredibly realistic. It'd be very difficult uh, for him uh, to, um, to, to stand at that position. 
But what's interesting about this, and it's the same thing that's interesting about the standard of or, is that we have implied movement. Um, and this is unusual at this time period as well. He is clearly walking forward. Um, and um, it's really cool because unlike a lot of the sculptures that we will see um, in Rome that are um, subtractive, this is additive. It's it's terracotta. It's built up over um, around a frame, um, and so he has some stuff here that is really unusual for sculptures um, that were being created at the same time in um, in Greece. Look at the musculature in the leg. Look at the musculature in the arms. And what you're seeing here is um, that movement is implied, but we're also we know that what we're looking at is um, uh, the reenacting of the, the story of the labors of Hercules. Um, and this is the third um, labor of, um, of Hercules when um, Apollo and Artemis, his twin, are very angry because um, Hercules has, has killed a deer that belonged to Artemis. And so what you see here is this confrontation between um, Hercules and Apollo. Uh, and they're very angry at him for killing Artemis's deer. But this idea of this movement, this idea of the musculature that is here, uh, this is something that um, sort of disappears for a while after um, Greece and Rome and isn't sort of rediscovered again until um, the Renaissance. Uh, and that's why they sometimes call them the Dark Ages. I hate that. Um, uh, but the Middle Ages, it's... Um, it's like we sort of forgot how to do stuff and we had to be re-reminded, we had to rediscover um, how to do some of these very realistic things. All right, so then we're gonna get into one more, oh, sorry, one more thing, which is this piece. This is the last Etruscan piece that we're gonna do. Um, and this is from uh, uh, Tarquinia, which is again, part of the Etruscan empire. And it is called the Tomb of the Triclinium. And what a triclinium is, is an ancient dining table. And so if you look at the wall back here, you will see people resting on their sides like we see in the sarcophagus of the spouses. Because what we see here in the Tomb of the Triclinium is a reconstruction of a, an Etruscan um, banquet scene. Uh, and it would have, when it was created, um, it would have been a tomb that would have held the remains of um, an entire family, okay? Uh, the family shared tombs. This is fresco. We're going to talk about fresco again uh, when we do Rome. Uh, I don't want to try to teach you too many terms all at the same time, but this is fresco, and that's painting on plaster. And what we have been able to um, figure out is um, these tombs were made of that volcanic rock uh, that we talked about, that tuffa, and then you would paint over top of them um, with this um, special paint. Um, and we'll talk about that when we do room. But the interesting thing is all of the paintings that have been found from the Etr Etruscan time period, every single one of them has been funerary every single one, every painting that we've been able to been, been able to dig up, reconstruct, whatever, every single one of them is funerary. Um, and so that leads us to believe that, um, that you know, the, the Etruscans took death very seriously, um, but they also knew that, or believed that death was a, um, something to be celebrated. It was important, but it was something to be celebrated. Um, this was uh, one of 280 chambers that have been found throughout the Etrus Etruscan Empire. And some of them were found with the furniture still in place, set up like it's a banquet. Um, and uh, they believe that the sarcophagus of the spouses may have been in a tomb like this with a table and them on the banquet's bench. And it would have made sense, right? Because it would have been on the banquet bench and they would have been in the tomb and they would have been having a feast because what we know is um, uh, everything is very bright. Everything is very positive. Everything is very celebratory. Um, and we know that um, they exaggerate the, the size of the, um, 
the faces and the heads to make them very clearly identifiable. But the hands um, uh, seem to be also uh, uh, more exaggerated because the, there seemed to be something with the hand motions that we're not exactly sure about. Um, there is throughout many of them a repeated circular pattern um, and because circular patterns when connected with death often make archaeologists art historians think like the circle of life life and time the circle of life and death and rebirth um, and death is a celebration of the dead um, and death for the Etruscans brings them into um, sort of a new existence, um, into this new um, way of, uh, uh, of existing. Um, so it's really important that we see that to the Etruscans, um, based on the sarcophagus of the spouses, based on um, you know, a lot of the other uh, pieces of Etruscan uh, uh, artworks that we have found and based on um, the actual um, discussions of Etruscan work um, by Vitruvius, uh, we are able to identify that, um, you know, this is a, po a death positive culture. Um, and, uh, and all of their artwork seems to lead us to believe this was a very positive culture that believed very strongly in the equality um, of men and women. Um, and uh, it, uh, I kind of wish that I lived there a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, that is the end of Etruscans. Um, this, the theme for this is a fresco. Uh, and you're going to want to write that down. And we're going to see way more frescoes when we're done with this, um, before we're all done with um, uh, art history. Uh, but this is uh, the tomb of the Triclinium, and that is the end of the ancient Near East. And when I see you next time, we will be doing ancient Egypt.